Hello and welcome to the Westminster Standard. I'm Ryan Beasy. Recently, there has been much discussion on the internet alleging that the PCA has an abuse problem. The PCA church courts are not adequate to serve victims of abuse, we're told, or the PCA church courts simply don't work properly. While I'm certain there are instances of abuse within the Presbyterian Church in America, and every instance of abuse is an assault on the honor of Christ's name. Nonetheless, I do not believe it is true that our church courts and our system of government are inadequate to address matters of abuse. While our system of government is not yet perfect, I believe most of our troubles are the result of a failure to abide by the procedures and policies set forth in our book of church order. So even as we look to amend refine, and perfect the BCO of the Presbyterian Church in America, we should not do so without realizing the benefits and protection of our robustly biblical Presbyterian polity. In a moment, we'll hear from two men who have a great deal of personal experience with the courts of the PCA about a case in particular in which our Standing Judicial Commission noted abuse in the way a lower court handled a matter. This is worthy of consideration, I believe, because it demonstrates to us the importance of not simply being reformed and Calvinistic in our soteriology or our worship, but also to be Presbyterian in the way we operate as courts of the church. We must operate in accordance with our agreed-upon rules in the BCO and follow and uphold the vows we have taken to our Presbyterian polity. In this case, were numerous errors presumptions, and impositions made by a church session. Very serious allegations, eventually outlandish charges, were made against church members by their own elders who were called to feed Christ's lambs. When facing charges and a trial by their own elders, these members did not flee. They did not simply reject the authority of the church, nor did they, as is so common today, deconstruct their faith and then slander the bride of Christ. Instead, these seven men were committed to being Presbyterians, and so they made their case to the church courts. And two separate courts of the church ruled against them, found them guilty, barred them from the Lord's table. At that point, many would probably give up on the church, but these seven men pressed on, and the case was reviewed by the Standing Judicial Commission of the Presbyterian Church in America, and they pressed on because they believe the Presbyterian system of government works. Now, we know that church courts and councils may err, and many have erred. But here is an example of the church courts functioning justly and rightly eventually. It takes time and a willingness to be heard and to be patient with the bride of Christ and to wait on the Lord. But the Lord vindicated his name and upheld justice. And so what follows will be deeply disturbing and troubling. I was genuinely frightened as I read some of the quotations from the record of the case in this ruling. So viewer discretion is advised. But nonetheless, I think if you will stick with us for this episode, you will be profoundly encouraged, both by the tenacity of our guests and the integrity of the judges who sit on our standing judicial commission. This should encourage us that yes, Presbyterianism works. It just may take a while. And so let me welcome uh, first former moderator of the General Assembly, Dr. Dominic Aquila, and also uh, Mr. Paul Harrell, a uh, member of uh, what we affectionately call the Jonesboro Seven. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on. Ryan, thanks for having me, us. (laughs) So, uh, Mr. Moderator, how many times have you been a church planter? Uh, I've planted uh, uh, (laughs) three and a half churches. I guess, because one was a replant, so uh, three churches and um, a replant uh, along the way. Over. So you're an, you're, you're an experienced church planter, you're president of New Geneva Seminary, you've been moderator of the General Assembly, and you've been a judge on the Standing Judicial Commission uh, throughout your uh, career in the PCA, yep. is that right? Over 25 years. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Well, you're, you're well known in the PCA. You've uh, given your, uh, your story, as they say, on PresbyCast at least uh, once. But Paul Harrell, I think this is, uh, this is perhaps your first time on uh, a PCA-centered podcast outside of the Aquila Report podcast, the TAR Top Ten, which you do host. Uh, tell us about yourself. How did you come well, to the Reformed faith? Okay, well, uh, that's a good question. So I was born and raised uh, you know, where I live now and here in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I was raised Baptist, came to faith in Christ as a Baptist. Uh, And then 
I uh, started going to a, I would call it a, a revitalization project. It was a Baptist church in the, uh, the pastor there was, uh, you know, reformed in his soteriology. And that's when I became, uh, I would say, you know, reformed or a Calvinist then uh, just by hearing the word of God preached in a way mm. I never had. And uh, that, so that was good. You know, it was a time in my life of just, you know, tremendous spiritual growth and, and then I always knew about, you know, the PCA and, and uh, R.C. Sproul mainly. Um, and, and anyway, so eventually we, you know, we found ourselves at uh, Christ Redeemer Church Plant and uh, decided to go there because of uh, really um, the goalposts of the PCA were something that the rules in the goalposts were something that really attracted me Um to the PCA um, because I knew this would be a safe place. A lot of time mm. you hear the world, the world talk about safe spaces. I knew this would be a safe place uh, for me and my family to worship. And mm. uh, that's, that's the, what the main reason I, I went aside from, you know, the theology being the, the number one thing, but uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of briefly uh, okay. my background. So great. And what do you do uh, now? You're not, you're not an elder. Is that right? You're no, uh, no. a church member. I'm just a church member. Just say no, a, a just about person. it. Yeah, <clears throat> strict, strictly a church member. So yeah. tell me about uh, Christ Redeemer Presbyterian Church in America. Over the last month or two here on the podcast, we've had a, a few episodes dealing with philosophy of ministry. I want to hear some of the philosophy of ministry of the church plant there. Um, how did you go about organizing a church plant? Uh, were you on the original core group, or did you come uh, to the the church later on? I was not among the original core group. We started attending in 2017. It was founded in 2016. Uh, so, but many of the people who are part of the core group are still still there today. So, I, I don't have you know the context of of what it was like in the very beginning. I've I've heard some stories, um, but but coming to 20 <laughs> coming in in 2017 was right after the the birth of our uh, our daughter, um, and you know it it was it was great. The people. I, that's mm. what I, I'll just tell you that the, the people uh, were and are fantastic. And, uh, and that's really what drew us there. You, the, the, the Holy Spirit was was there amongst this group of believers. That was what was evident to, to, to me and my wife. And it's it's what kept us going back. So wonderful. So Jonesboro is not a new town. It's not like it's a, a new suburb that you know is growing <laughs> outward uh, from, from a city. It's, it's an established uh, community in, in Arkansas, one of the larger cities there. So how do you go about introducing Christ to an old town uh, that's probably predominantly Baptist, probably has a lot of folk religion, uh, where people have no knowledge of Presbyterianism or the Reformed faith? How do you go about uh, seeing the Lord build a church there, what means has he used? So here's what I've learned. They do know about the Reformed faith. Uh, this, oh. this, is, this, is the, this is where, this is the truth of the matter, and I would encourage um, anybody that is going into what uh, one member of our church calls an Ar Arminian wasteland, uh, um, jokingly, of course, but it's the truth. Um, I don't know if there's intelligent assessments that are done. I think there are when it comes to we're going to maybe plant a church here or there. Uh, but what I have found is when the flagship denomination is what I would call the PCA is planning a church, all of your, uh, all of your reformed people, okay, who have kind of given up and decided to just put their heads down and serve in a, you know, Baptist Armenian context, uh, you're going to attract the, the radicals, if you will, so to speak. Uh, and that's exactly what happened, uh, here. Um, and we had, we, we did also have, uh, you know, some covenant children from the PCA that happened to have moved here. So obviously there was that, but then there were others who were, you know, attracted to the church because they knew uh, what the denomination stood for and they were reformed. They had just, there just weren't any options here. And so I, I would say that that is, uh, I think it's kind of a, a misnomer. I think in the future, if you're going to try to plant a church uh, in, in, a, in a town where there really is no you know, reform. You don't need to try to plant some non-denominational church, you know, that is Presbyterian in name only, or, you know, people don't really know what that is. I think you need to assume that there's going to be people that know who you are. And uh, that's, that's what happened. So. Especially in the deep South, perhaps. Uh, so uh, you've recently uh, had a, an organizing pastor, a new organizing pastor called uh, and installed. He's, I think, also an assistant at uh, 
is it Covenant Prez in uh, in Cleveland, Mississippi? Yes, uh, the uh, T.E. Bill Berry, the Reverend Bill Berry, is uh, now on the ground here in Jonesboro, and uh, yeah, he is under our, our borrowed session, as we're still a church plant, is uh, Covenant uh, Presbyterian Church in Cleveland, Mississippi. We're very okay. grateful for them, uh, and yeah, we, we're very grateful to have Bill Berry here on the ground. He is um, the, uh, the, the deputy uh, chaplain uh, for the Arkansas National Guard. Uh, and he is, uh, so, and he's done that for a very, very long time and he's got a great testimony as well at what led him to the, the Presbyterian, uh, denomination and, uh, we're loving it. We're, we're absolutely loving it. So mm. does he, does he preach in boots? Uh, probably sometimes, although I haven't noticed. I don't, I don't, I don't know. You don't look at his feet, huh? Yes, we don't look at his feet. <laughs> I think there's a movie about that called Shawshank Redemption. Um, oh, right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, every church plant, every congregation encounters difficulties and challenges and learns to trust in God more as a result. Can you share some of the stories of God's provision uh, for this church plant over the years? I would just say, and I think this may be true for, uh, you know, a lot of people, I mean, our church plant survived COVID-19 and all of the, you know, the hysteria and, and the lockdowns and the closures and that sort of thing. So there's that. Uh, we also, you know, quite frankly, we survived, I know we're going to talk about it, but we also survived this, you know, this judicial case that's basically kind of taken up the last three years as well. Um, so I, I would say those things, uh, and in the midst of all of that, um, there's still fruit and there's still people, uh, you know, worshiping God every Sunday. So that's, uh, that's how he has certainly provided for us. Yeah, so you, you mentioned this has sort of a long been a long process of particularization. Um, you had a different organizing pastor uh, yeah. up until recently, is that right? Yes. And uh, so what, uh, maybe a moderator Aquila can uh, distinguish the difference between a, an organizing pastor and a permanent pastor. What, what would be the difference there? Well, when the church is a mission church, it, uh, it get, is not in a position to call anyone yet uh, because they are not organized uh, to have a session in place, uh, or, you know, a body of elders to oversee the local body. And so for that, then the presbytery then uh, erects some um, means of governance. So it can uh, be a, um, a different elders from around the presbytery. It can be a session from another church, uh, any number of ways like that. So they are still treated as a mission church, but with some of the organized abilities to uh, receive and dismiss members for the elders to give oversight so that there's promise. But the uh, person who comes as the uh, pastor is the organizing pastor or the mission pastor. Uh, once the church becomes particularized, it means it now um, has, will elect its own elders and have an, a session or the body of elders then uh, then the church can also call a, an organize, a, a pastor, and in many cases it's the organizing pastor who is called as the full-time pastor, and now the church is no longer mission, it's particularized and organized, and it's ready to uh, fly on its own. Okay, so uh, you had some uh, concerns a difference of philosophy in terms of your philosophy of ministry, a difference in vision for the church uh, than your original uh, organizing pastor. And uh, can you unpack, you know, what that looks like? You know, it, was, it wasn't personal. It was just a difference in, in vision and, and philosophy, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially, you know, me and six other, uh, six other men, um, we, you know, we— came to the opinion that, hey, we were on the cusp of particularization. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, I mean, quite honestly, the particularization, the particularization process, uh, the way things were happening uh, to us seemed corrupt. And uh, we decided to um, essentially, you know, confront the organizing pastor about that um, and also bring up things like the philosophy of ministry uh and that sort of thing and um and the then there was a meeting with the session and uh then essentially we were pronounced uh, guilty without process then we filed a complaint 
uh, that was denied by the session because we were found guilty without process. And uh, then the presbytery took that up because the complaint was denied. And then the presbytery sided uh, with us uh, partially and sustained our complaint and said that uh, the session uh, was out of order. Um, and uh, not too long after that, uh, we were then formally charged. Uh, well, yeah, but, and, and before we we get to that, let me let me just, sorry to interrupt. So this this when you say session, uh, that's a that's a BCO fifteen one commission, right? Uh, well, over- this in this case, it's not. It's a BCO five appointment by Presbytery to an organized okay. church. So, so these this was a temporary session yes. that the Presbytery yeah. had put in place. These aren't these aren't your elders per se, in the sense that you elected them. They were assigned to you by the Presbytery. Uh, so you went to your uh, this temporary session, which had been uh, in place by the Presbytery, which is a standard uh, procedure, and you mm-hmm. noted these concerns, and, and you said, we'd rather not have our current organizing pastor as our permanent pastor. Well, so yeah. for, L- Let me for. just say, if I could, uh, Paul, just say one correction uh, to it. Uh, the, um, uh, Paul mentioned that there was the complaint first, and then later on there's going to be uh, a judicial trial. Uh, so they, the, the seven weren't pronounced guilty at that, that early. They were just said, they you either comply or we'll consider this, and that's what filed the, com- filed the complaint. Yeah. yeah, I mean, here, yeah. here's uh, just just so we know here. I um, mean, I've got, um, yeah. I've got the complaint in front of me. Okay, yeah. and again, this is different from the case that you posted to Twitter, um, you know, several <clears throat> weeks ago. Uh, but uh, this is what the Judicial Commission of Covenant Presbytery said when we complained. Uh, in this regard, the complaint is sustained in part and denied in part. The record contains no evidence that the session instituted formal process against the complainants. Before sending the September 10th and 16th letters, both letters contain actions and language which are only proper during and at the conclusion of judicial process. Admonition, citation, quote, have sinned, end quote, repent, uh, present evidence of repentance, reaffirm vows, etc., Any congregant who received either the September 10th or 16th letters would reasonably conclude they were under process and being censured. Thus, the complaint must be sustained to the extent that the two letters administered restricted discipline without properly initiating and continuing judicial process as required by the BCO. So that's why I said we were, you know, essentially pronounced guilty. I mean, just based on the reasoning of of the commission, they didn't actually say we were guilty, uh, you know, guilty end quote guilty uh but but that's how you would feel Uh, you know and and bco 38 4 it sounded like that was the avenue they were trying to use uh you know and and that is sometimes necessary to remove people from the role of the church without process if they make it known that they have no intention to fulfill their vows but that's not what y'all were doing as i as i understand it as i read through the the verdict uh from the judicial commission yeah, I mean, we went to the session with our concerns, and we we basically said, "Hey, look, um, we we're, we can no longer support this man to to become uh, the permanent pastor. We knew particularization was coming, and so we wanted to say, look, I mean, uh, and I think if we had been particularized church already, I mean, you know, there there would be no avenue. But we all we all knew that there was an expectation uh, that once we were particularized, the congregation would have representation on a session um and there were things that what we thought would happen differently if we were given the church government that we were supposed to get yeah. and so uh we told the session hey look we we can't we're not going to vote for this guy when it comes up that's essentially what we said we're unanimous or at least the seven of seven of us seven households yeah seven households we're, we're not we're not going to do it and we did this because thought it was fair we thought it was actually the loving thing to do it was hard to do yeah um, but we thought it was the nice thing to do as opposed to waiting until the day voting against somebody and totally blindsiding them right, uh, right. you know getting uh you know i think we were over we were in the mid 40s uh, represented you know 40 percent of the church um and later much later we, we actually found out that had the vote been held um he, he would not have uh, gotten a majority. So not even a majority, not even a, you know a slim majority. So it seems to me in my you know brief experience as a minister uh, in the PCA that sometimes people will try to make disagreements over principle and turn them into uh, relational uh, personal disagreements. 
Uh, is that what you think happened, that you, you had a, a principial disagreement, uh, a philosophy, disagreement about philosophy, and the session took it to be a personal dislike or personal uh, disdain for uh, your organizing pastor at the time? Yes, that is, I would say that's what happened. Uh, there was some sort of expectation in their minds that if we had a problem with him, it had to be a sin issue. Mm. We never charged him with any sin. Uh, we, uh, you know, liken this to just, you know, different ministerial philosophies. We see that in the scriptures where people have to go their separate ways, uh, but they still are brothers in Christ. And uh, that's that's what it was for us. Um, yeah. uh, you know, is there anything, you know, looking back uh, that you think you could have done to help them see that this is not personal, this is not relational, this is philosophical and principial? Or was it just, did you perceive, in your opinion, that they were unwilling to, to see it that way? Um, man, it's a tough, that's a tough way to yeah, answer This was years ago. Um, well, I mean, no, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess I have to say, no, I don't. I feel like that's what we did. Um, I mean, you can look, uh, you just look at the references in the, in the SJC case that, that is public, um, the, the different, the correspondence, the letters back and forth, you know, we, we tried to, we tried to tell them that we, we, we didn't have any ill will. We, we were just essentially standing up for our rights as congregate members under the BCO. Yeah, and, yeah. uh, I, granted there's probably, maybe there's not a lot of, of lay people that know the BCO well enough to do that. Had we not met Dominic, we would not have, have known to do much of that. Um, but we, what we did, and we did it because we were committed to uh, Presbyterianism, quite frankly. So yeah, the, the, this is what the SJC uh, said. The evidence introduced at trial uh, shows unequivocally that the accused only expressed their concerns that T.E. Rayford Wayford, uh, was called to serve uh, their congregation as minister, not that he was disqualified uh, from ministry. So you weren't saying anything, you know, about him uh, personally, just about him professionally, philosophically, uh, principially. Yeah, you know, and, and it is pronounced Rayford. Uh, Rayford. Yeah, that's exactly right. We that That's all we were doing. Um, we had, uh, you know, the... So our, our borrowed session at the time, you know, was in Memphis, Tennessee. We're, you know, 50 miles from the Mississippi, you know, in Jonesboro. And, um, you know, we, we, had, we had been around, you know, we had experienced church life, you know, with, with him. Uh, and we had been around him for years and years, you know, those who were around yeah. since 2016. And so, uh, you know, there, there was a lot that led to this this conclusion that, hey, you know, going forward, we're, we're going to have to do something this different. This just isn't a good fit. Is, That's right. It sounds wasn't like, a good fit. It was fit, not not personal, not relational, uh, not, yeah. Oh, so um, you know, this case went all the way to the Standing Judicial Commission, as we said, uh, to the General Assembly. Uh, so what did they end up, they indicted you with something? What did they end up indicting you with? We were indicted with violating the fifth and ninth commandment. The fifth commandment uh, being that we uh, were not submitting to the authority of uh, of the church. Uh, that we had somehow um, represented ourselves as the session, and then we were in violated of the ninth commandment because um, they uh, assumed that in order for all seven of us to come to the conclusion that. Uh, T.E. Rayford wasn't a good fit, that we must have slandered him in some way to come to that, uh, to come to that conclusion. So fundamentally, the idea was, uh, if you are expected to vote for a minister um, to, to pick your leaders, you are also expected to not talk about it amongst yourselves, which of course is preposterous, and the SJC saw that that was preposterous. So what evidence, you know, it sounds like they were assuming you were gossiping or something? What, what evidence, what specifics, you know, we have the charge and then the specification in any indictment, what evidence uh, did they offer uh, of, of your guilt? Zero. No evidence. Nothing. Yeah, that, uh... <laughs> there, there was no evidence. Well, there is so no evidence. Were each of you indicted individually, or was it just a group of, you know, you, you seven came and talked to us, and, and exp how, how, does, how did that, what did that look like? We were all indicted with identical indictments, which is something the SJC uh, shredded, by the way. Um, and at trial, there was, 
you know, purported evidence, witnesses testifying, uh, uh, you know, against us, but no, none of them could corroborate anything. Um, uh, there wasn't, you know, two or more witnesses. Um, they, they weren't actually testifying to time, place, circumstances, or any of that. Um, and or, or so, substance of, of what you said or what you, yeah. Yeah, no, it was actually, the, that trial, <clears throat> I, I would say, sitting through that trial was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life. Um, there's obviously been fruit from it, but it was uh, certainly a learning experience. But, yeah, they tried all seven of us with identical indictments. And so the SJC actually points this out, that that's a very you know, precarious thing to do, especially when you have an allegation against one person, let's say at the trial, but the, the witness brought in has no allegation against any of the other six. So how can we be made responsible for uh, an allegation you know, is for somebody else. And this is clear in, in the opinion. Um, th this, this was, uh, honestly, <laughs> well, anyway, go, go ahead. So, yeah, I see this quote from the, uh, I think it's from the record of the case, but it's in our general assembly handbook. So it's, it's public in Clint Wilkie's uh, testimony. The witness said he could not recall what every single person said or did at the August 30 meeting. Although he remembered the man in the blue shirt. Uh, I see you're wearing a blue shirt there. Does that mean that you're you're guilty? We'll never know. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm not uh, the man in the blue shirt. But yes, go okay. on. But I am uh, wearing be, a blue so shirt. So you uh, sit down. The witness ever identifies the man in the blue shirt was was uh, so this this wasn't one of your elders, was it? It was just someone who was at the meeting and called to testify. Yeah. So yeah, the, everything revolved, and Dominic was great at, at hammering this out, you know, when everything was, when we were looking at, at what, we were trying to figure out how to defend ourselves, which we, in fact, did not mount a defense. But, yeah, if you can put that back up there. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, let me, let me so, so, Sorry, our, our production team is not exactly It's all right. Much. So, T.E., so T.E. Clint Wilkie, or I'm sorry, Reverend Clint Wilkie. Now, and the reason is, is because if you go look at the case, when we start, this is an interesting thing. This is how, this is, this was the atmosphere that we were in in that courtroom. We, uh, we, the only thing we did was ask cross-examination questions. And so after Clint Wilkie's testimony, we asked him and we said, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Wilkie, and we were quickly corrected that it was Reverend Wilkie and that we will address him as Reverend. And so then we, anyway, just so, re so Reverend Wilkie testimony. So the witness said he could not recall what every single person said or did at the August 30th meeting. Now that right there. So, so why, are, so what are you testifying to exactly? Quote, the man in the blue shirt being asked to sit down. Interestingly enough, uh, the man in the blue shirt was was never asked to sit down. The man in the blue shirt was asked to calm down, but not to sit down. So I feel like that, that's just another moment that to me was uh, just inaccurate and something to notice. The witness never identified who the man in the blue shirt was. So the testimony, even assuming that asking a man to sit down is sufficient to convict a man of an offense, is insufficient evidence of an offense against the remaining six. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Another thing that happened in that testimony, by the way, is we asked uh, Reverend Wilkie to identify by name all seven defendants, and he could not do it. And so, again, what, what are you doing testifying uh, when you are not able to do time, place, circumstance? And uh, anyway, you can imagine uh, how confused we were. So, And just as a point of context, uh, Mr. Moderator uh, Aquila, my understanding was that in church courts, everyone is mister. There's no... It, it, Technically, it, you know, yeah, that's correct. You don't make any other distinctions. Uh, let me also, though, add here, <clears throat> when the um, seven men each received the indictment separately, so you were asking if they did it, just there was one corporate indictment or seven there each one received the indictment um, that they only had the charges there were no specifications so uh, we began writing uh, you know looking at the book church order bco 32 5 specifically says that the court should have a list not only the charges but also specifications that is the particulars what in what way were those uh, offenses those commandments violated and uh, so they um, so, you know, in terms of times, place, circumstances, so it, it specifically has to be listed. So the, uh, the first time uh, we did this four times, uh, the first time the response was to just a sentence saying we have um, received uh, guidance of mothers and what we've sent is sufficient and constitutional. So we waited a week, we wrote a second time saying, well, we've looked at this 
in trying to prepare for the case uh, in defending defending ourselves, we don't know in what way uh, specifically you're saying the being able to uh, allege that we violate the fifth commandment and the ninth commandment. And uh, so in the book says this, and then I added some more content uh, to that and gave some examples like, and then I said, for instance, spe specificate that on or about some such a date, this happened or this person spoke to someone or something of that event. And uh, again, we, the response was, we've already addressed this. And uh, so waited a little bit more and we sent it the third time. And the third time, a little bit more data. We just remember this is what we said. And we're still having trouble preparing for uh, the trial because we don't know in what way the the uh, we violated the fifth commandment, ninth commandment. And so it says, well, you know what it is and you are being disingenuous to claim that you don't know. And so we're back the fourth time saying if that's the case and, uh, you know, if we're supposed to know and we don't, uh, then you obviously know. So well, just say it and make it make it legitimate. So Shepherd they us. never they never fix it. And um, so at that point of my counsel to the uh, seven uh, defendants were to was to uh, go to submit to the trial because failing to do that, you could be charged with contumacy. Yeah. And I said, you don't want to go there that you're going to still honor the court. You can be respectful that everything's going to be done decently in order. And that's when the trial then was held. Uh, so uh, six months after trial, uh, you uh, appealed to Presbytery. Well, not six months after, but you, you eventually appealed to Presbytery. And then six months after your trial, uh, you were sent some specifics. Maybe maybe it was just Presbytery was sent some specifics. Would those specifics have been helpful in preparing your defense? Okay, what you're talking about is called an addendum. Uh, so when we were, we found this as we were preparing, uh, if memory serves correct, we were preparing for the, yeah, the challenging for Presbytery. So we appealed to Presbytery. So now we've got to get a record of the case together, right? Which we had previously been uh, uh, familiar with because we had to compile a record of the case and decide what that record of the case was going to be in our previous complaint, which was sustained in part. Okay. So we're going through the process and we weren't, we're getting all of our documents together, which are many, because we want the, then at this point, there's a long history. You have all the documents and the transcripts from the complaint, uh, all the way, you know, from the, to the trial. And so we get the proposed record of the case and I'm, you know, scouring it. I read every word and I uh, come across this document out of nowhere called addendum to the indictment date 5 May, 2021. And I, I, I call up the other men and I, I when we start basically just scouring our emails and on our records, that where did this document come from? Now, this in this addendum to the indictment uh, attempts to put more specifics to to the case. Right now, even even the even this addendum, th these specifics are still uh, total, total hearsay. And they don't even I mean, they're not evidence. It's still just, you know, the belief of the session. Uh, that we think, you know, on or about this date. Matter of fact, I could even read part of it here if I can find it. Uh, we believe there is enough evidence that the defendants met together on multiple occasions regarding T.E. Rayford's call to pastor and their collective desire to have him removed. We believe that the call to have T.E. Rayford removed as pastor started on or around the time, uh, you know, Tyrus Teague was approached by uh, uh, T.E. Rayford. I'm getting into the weeds here. Um we charge the so the actions leading up to and following the meetings of August 30th, 2020, uh, that that's when, you know, an alleged the alleged offenses happened. But again, there was there's nobody that was there. There's nobody that, uh, you know, heard what was said. There's nobody that can testify to what was said. And so even even the addendum was was insufficient uh, specifics to mount a defense, uh, because, again, they're not they're not telling us what was said. It was but speculative. This, it sounds like what you're right. saying. Right. And this document is, I, I still, I mean, this, the, I, I don't know where it came from. It obviously was submitted in between our, 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 our appeal at some point. I'm glad we caught it because what we did when we appealed to the SJC uh, was we were, we were able to get uh, a, a date of when this was submitted. Okay. We were able to, to, 
to to at least get them to admit that this document was never given to us. Hmm. It was added after after we filed our appeal. That's when it was uh, that's when it was added, which we just thought was extremely odd. So when I when I read what you were indicted with, I was shocked. You know, I was in a I was in a cold sweat that a church court uh, would do this. I thought, you know, if a church court can do this to these guys, it can do that uh, to anyone. Uh, so who were the judges at your trial? Uh, was it the, the same session that had investigated you and indicted you, or was it a different panel of judges that adjudicated the session's allegations? No, it, w- it was it was the same. Uh, and uh, and we did object to, and they were also listed as witnesses. So that was what was odd, is our judges were listed as witnesses against us, because all of the the session came to this meeting where, you know, everything kind of came down to this meeting. That's where they thought the, the sin really took place. Mr. Uh, moderator, do is that is that typical where a session in a, in a, in a local yeah. congregation? Right. You no, know, it is. Uh, it, this is one of the uh, maybe issues that we probably have to ris- visit and consider in the, um, you know, in amending our book. Uh, but it does allow for the session of the local church that has investigated and brought the charges also sit as judges. Uh, and there are other provisions that if it's too tense or it's not good or it's a small session, they can reference it to presbytery and let the presbytery handle it. And uh, at one point we actually presented that option since the matters between the session and their defendants was you know, very hostile and very tense. Uh, so we said, why don't we just reference, uh, re- request that they reference it to a commission, uh, to Presbytery and let them set up a commission to handle it. So, but but it, it on its face, it, according to the BCO, right now, the way it's structured, yes, it, it is possible. Or is the, it, it is in the book. Yeah, I, and I, that's something I've, I've struggled with as we've looked at things at Presbytery <clears throat> or at in, in the session here that, well, I, I, it, I think that's legal, but it, it just doesn't you know it doesn't doesn't smell right yeah. but it yeah and so maybe something where we need to perfect our polity a little bit more um, so in the in in the decision the standing judicial commission the general assembly said this in summary the failure of the indictments to include the specificity so obviously available is unjustifiable under BCO 325 and we find that the broad indictments were abused to the prejudice of the accused who were not adequately informed of the charges against them. So it seems to me that the General Assembly, through her Judicial Commission, is, is alleging uh, that uh, there was abuse. Uh, was, have you ever, in your vast experience, both as a judge and as a uh, as now a, a representative, have you ever seen a case like this where the, where the decision is so, um, I don't want to say, I, I'm struggling for an adjective. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so clear. Okay. Blatant. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, it happens more than we, we know. Um, so that keeps me busy with a lot of cases. Um, and uh, so I've got about something like eight cases in the pipeline to the mm. SJC right now. And um, most of them include some kind of um, reference, you know, that some level where I would consider it abuse of the system and of the of the handling of the Book of Church order. Paul, the, the SJC seems to be saying that the that you were abused by the way that, uh, or at least the, the system was abused. <laughs> would you agree with that assessment? Hundred percent, yeah. I mean, it's you know, I mean, we're we're on the other side of it now. Uh, there's yeah. still people that are healing from it. There's still people hurt sure. by it. Uh, you know, you also have to think about our wives and all of this, what they went through during all of this. Uh, keep yeah. in mind that we were <clears throat> we were suspended from the from the Lord's table during this time as well for nothing. I I, I can't I can't that that that's that is what I think a lot of us are still. Yeah, we were we were falsely accused. We were falsely convicted with no evidence. We had our that we had we were we were barred from the Lord's table for months. And so uh, even on appeal, they 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 they, 
even on appeal. They, yeah, yeah wow. the the uh, BCO forty two six does allow that when a yeah uh, when someone files an appeal, it has the effect of suspending the judgment and the censure against the uh, defendant, the accused, uh, until the matter has been determined by the higher court. Uh, and then it has a however, and then the however is that um, the court the against whom the appeal is taken uh, can, without it being a form of censure, yeah. uh, supposedly how we do that, I don't know, uh, can uh, continue to hold the, put the, keep the censure in place. And um, so that that is what Paul and the other six went through, uh, is that uh, having a, such a clear, um, you know, in a clear way um, ruling from the SJC that the uh, session acted incorrectly and the press story didn't help either. And that they they had a commission that unanimously recommended the press secretary that the appeal was not in order. And so that's the reason it had to go to the SJC. Wow. Um, that it was that everything was right. They did everything correctly. And when we knew in heart of hearts that it just wasn't, and the SJC saw that, but uh, my counsel to the brothers were was that uh, that it, you, you, if you really want to see this thing through to the end, uh, you go ahead and bow to that present, even if it, we believe it's wrong. Uh, there's no place for a rebellion. Let still honor the system and yeah. go through it. And these guys, I mean, they were troopers in the good sense of that term. And they maintained uh, their integrity, their uh, love for the Lord, their fellowship with the people of God. And uh, so they, they're to be commended on that. And so it was a great relief, obviously, that they could finally come to the Lord's table once again, once the uh, matter was finally completed and adjudicated by the SJC. I want to show a, a, a short video of one SJC judge speaking on the floor of the General Assembly uh, and get your, get your thoughts. Eight, to what purpose do you rise? I speak in favor of the BCO amendment. Go ahead then, sir. Howie Donahoe, Pacific Northwest Presbytery. I told a guy a half hour ago I wasn't going to go to a mic to hold the General Assembly. And first item, I'm up. Who uh, took, our who took said, that bet? Our Presbytery sent this. Um, 76 Presbyteries voted for it, four voted against it. You'll note that in our BCO for as long as I can remember. This shall never be done in the way of censure. Well, how do you know? We, we don't require Presbyterians to demonstrate it wasn't by the way of censure. Um, the previous speaker talked about a majority. So if a guy gets convicted on a 51 to 50 majority, that's pretty tight. And you can administratively suspend him by a one vote margin and he will lose his job because the appeal process takes a very long time. I've reviewed a number of cases where it appeared to me that it was imposed in a way of censure, but there's nothing the higher court can do about that because we can't prove that. We don't know why people voted that way. But a 51% majority can cause a minister to lose his job because they're not going to be able to pay him for the eight months it takes for his appeal to run through this standing judicial commission. Uh, if it's that obvious, the example the previous speaker said, if it's that obvious, you better, it better be easy to get two-thirds of the press period to, to impose it. So I think this is a good change. Apparently, the vast majority of presbyteries thought it was a good change, too. So uh, teach, uh, Ruling Elder uh, Donahoe, SJC judge, uh, speaking on the floor of the General Assembly about a change that we adopted just a few months ago to require a two-thirds uh, threshold, two-thirds majority threshold, in order to suspend someone from a uh, minister from office or the sacraments uh, while an appeal runs its course. And he says, you know, I think that's a good change. And he said, I reviewed a number of cases where it appeared to me it was done by way of censure. So he seems to have observed as a, as a judge on the SJC over the course of several, uh, not several, but I think two decades, um, that, he, that he suspects that some courts took that action simply for punitive purposes. Now, Paul, I'm not asking you to 
comment on the motives of the temporary session, but you as a survivor of what the SJC called abuse, how did you feel? I mean, did you feel as though you were being pastored and shepherded by the temporary session, as though you, as though they were genuinely looking out for your soul, that they were trying to call you to repentance, or did you feel like they were just punishing you for not staying in your place? How did you feel over we, that we, process of, of months? Really, ever since we, you know, we got after the meeting where we, we, you know, expressed our our belief or basically just said, "Hey, look, we're not going to vote for this guy." You know, it, we, we never really felt pastured from the beginning, you know, because we got a letter essentially saying that we have we may have sinned. And then we got another letter and, and we it, it was it was power literally wielded over us that that they, mm. they did not have is what I know now. So we, we were all. You know, it was speculative that, hey, look, this is this is just going to be some some sort of, you know, long drawn out battle. And uh, but then. I will tell you when I knew for certain this was not about our souls. I can tell you right immediately. When I, this is this is when I knew for certain that this was not about our souls, and that's when we filed our appeal with the presbytery after we were convicted. We filed a timely appeal, and when that happened, our borrowed session resigned. The pastors resigned, and they cl they attempted to close down our church. They paid out a severance uh, from our bank account of $90,000. Uh, and uh, some of that money was... You said 90 or 9? 90. 90,000. Almost six-figure severance. And that crippled our bank account. And so uh, we... Uh, that's when I knew it wasn't about... Because, see, you see, discipline is about restoration and reconciliation. And we were and going through Christ. the process, and we we if we filed an appeal with Presbytery, just like we did with the complaint, and when we filed the appeal, the rest of the half of the church that knew not was going what what was going, I didn't know what was going on. We were told we couldn't tell the rest of the church what was going on, so we abided by that. So the rest of the church gets punished, and the church gets shuttered because we filed an appeal. So the so literally they abandoned the disciplinary process. Because we filed an appeal. May I uh, interrupt for um, Mr. Moderator? Is that a lawful injunction that you to to that just doesn't seem ministerial or declarative to me? Now I'm 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 uh, a neophyte mm -hmm. here. May a session tell a, a member, even a member under discipline, you may not talk about this. Is that no. is that lawful? No. Yeah. What you can't do is circularize the court, and that's a different thing. So that what that means is that you're not allowed to go and lobby those who are the voters the, on the court uh, with regard sure. to your, that, your that's position. Reasonable. So that's that's the only prohibition. But uh, nothing to it, say you can't talk to your neighbors and your right. friends about You know, pray with us struggle. and so forth. What you don't what you don't want to do, of course, is 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 stir up dissent that and that was the one thing that we really worked hard um, to not uh, um, allow to happen. And these men honored that statement so that as Paul said the rest of the congregation knew something was happening, but they didn't know what because mm -hmm. nobody was talking. So wow. they kept their mouth shut. Uh, they went through this whole thing. We, I don't know, uh, we almost had weekly Zoom meetings so I could uh, prop these guys up because it was yeah. not easy. And I said, I, I know it's hard, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it almost, it's almost like a daddy saying, uh, just trust me, uh, we're gonna, it gets better down the road. Yeah. And, uh, wow. you know, of course it went on because you had the, the time that it was in the appeal in the presbytery and then when they declined when they denied the appeal then you had to start all over with the uh, sjc which a minimum of six months so there's about 18 months from the time the trial was over to the time we had the uh, the final decision because of all the, the steps and that had to be taken so, so it was it was tough and uh, in the midst of it as paul said the uh, session decides, well, this is a toxic church. Uh, they're, they're, they, they're not going to pay attention, so it's better if we just close it down. They came with a recommendation of such to the presbytery. Fortunately, uh, some ministers and members uh, of the presbytery got in wind of some of the story, not from them, from other sources, uh, and they fought for the maintaining of the church and just less a point Let's keep the church going and appoint a new session 
And that's how Covenant Church in Cleveland, Mississippi, uh, then came to be the overseers of, uh, and, of the church. And, and, I, and I will have to say that your question earlier, how has the Lord been good to us, or you know, how has he seen us through the Covenant Presbytery deciding to keep our church open and those men uh, putting us in the hands of Cleveland was uh, just an absolute— um, it was something that ministered to us in a huge, huge way. And it, and it was the, I mean, it was just the work of God. That's, that's all I can tell you because I was at that meeting. I was the only one uh, from our church that went, you know, we needed somebody there because they were going to either decide to, you know, agree with the session's recommendation that had resigned. Like they resigned and then they recommended the presbytery shut the church down. And so there was a very vigorous debate you know, and uh, it was uh, we were just called, Dominic brings the word up toxic. I'm glad you did. We, we were we were called toxic over and over and over again. And there was a debate back and forth. And the members of our of our former session just kept saying, trust us. We can't get into it because the case is under appeal. But you just have to trust us. These men are toxic. This is awful situation. And, you know, just trust us, trust us. And thankfully, the uh, there were other members that they didn't. You know, they they didn't have that big of a bag for the benefit of the doubt of benefit of the doubt just because there's a TE in front of your name, mm. and and they uh, they questioned it, and but it was still rough. And the morning session was really 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 bad. They broke. They came back, and then they went into executive session. So I had to leave. But there was a man by the name of uh, uh, TE Don Irwin. Uh, he's from the western part of the state, and he wasn't even supposed to be there. He was there for another issue. He thought we were voting on the, uh, you know, the revoiced PCO. amendments, right? He thought they were, but they they had already voted on those. And uh, so he's he's there, and he's leave he's leaving at lunch, and he's he just kind of just feels that he can't leave. He turns around, comes back, and he speaks on the on on the floor. And I'm told that whatever he said is, is what convinced the the men in that room to keep our church open, and Providence. then. Yeah, it, it was it was amazing. It it, it 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 really was, and I cannot tell you, it was like, it was like it was literally going from from death to life, or it, it felt like going from death to life to have a morning session where there was so much slander, uh, to now all of a sudden, uh, we we we're we're going to still be a PCA church, which is what we wanted, and 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 we have these great folks at Covenant Cleveland who who are now. Uh, pastoring us and shepherding us, so it was it was awesome. So, just if if I can try to wrap my head around the the timeline, I know it's in the SJC decision, uh, but so they indicted you, they found you, well, they investigated you, they indicted you, they found you guilty. Uh, you appealed to Presbytery, and it, and they suspended you from the sacrament. You appealed to Presbytery, and that's the moment they say we're going to shut the church down. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, so uh, you said they investigated us. Um, for a week, I one, think it was. One of the Maybe witnesses, uh, one of the witnesses listed on the indictment, who who was excused and did not testify at the trial, one of the witnesses listed on the indictment didn't even know his name was going to be on there. So you say they investigated, but we have a guy who was. It was news to him to find out his name was on an indictment where he was going to be testifying against seven other men. <clears throat> wow. Um, so there, there was no attempt at pastoral care once you were suspended from the sacrament, and um, except except appeal. for the fact that there was uh, once the Covenant Cleveland yeah. session took over, it there was a whole dramatic shift. Wow. Uh, attitude, ministry wise, they wow. sent to uh, r- make sure there was a ruling out there every week, and mm-hmm. uh, and it was amazing. And uh, sometimes yeah, too, we had pulpit supply. Um, yeah. You and know. they took care of pulpit supply and all, and uh, so they they stepped up and did the shepherding during that time, which was a great time of healing, and um, so and of course that was after the presbytery then made its decision, and now it was before the SJC, and so like I said, when you somebody goes to the SJC, just because of the timeline, yeah, the timelines that are in there with gathering the record of the case and all sorts of other things, it just takes a while for the whole thing to be done with and it's very careful meticulous the intent is to make sure that nothing's rushed everything is uh, open and seen by the court to be able to you know render a decision but the covenant session in cleveland really is to be commended they they saved that church in the sense of caring for these people wow so ordinarily when uh an appeal goes to the sjc they 
uh, they, they look more at process, I think, than uh, the substance. So they do get into the substance and the facts. And, and we've been focusing, I think, most of our uh, consideration so far on the indictment and the lack of specificity. But uh, the case wasn't just about an indictment. It was you when you voiced your disagreement with uh, teaching out of Rayford's ministry philosophy, the session said this was a violation of the Fifth Commandment related to authority and the Ninth Commandment. Um, I'm going to quote uh, from um, the, uh, I think it's the session, the temporary session here from the SJC uh, document. Uh, we charge that the accused's unwillingness to accept the ruling of the session regarding Chi E. Wafer's call as pastor is a violation of the Fifth Commandment. Uh, and then the prosecutor, uh, who, who was the prosecutor in that case? Was it... Was it my uh, teaching elder Mike Malone. Okay, yeah, so I, I've got that, you know, I just want to make sure that I'm <laughs> somewhat accurate. Uh, the session has continued to voice its support of T.E. Rayford and believes without hesitation that he should be offered uh, to the congregation as a candidate to serve as its pastor. That's our job. That's our responsibility as a provisional uh, session, which I found to be uh, a curious... Uh, a curious statement. Um, uh, the prosecutor said that the persistent insistence that T.E. Rayford's name be removed as a candidate to be pastor of this church reflects a fundamental unwillingness to fulfill membership vow five and is disruptive of the peace of the church. So I, I, I found that those theses uh, curious in light of our sixth preliminary principle. Uh, Though the character, qualifications, and authority of church officers are laid down in the Holy Scriptures, as well as the proper method of officer investiture, the power to elect persons to the exercise of authority in any particular society rests in that society. So this is from our, you know, before you even get into the meat of the Book of Church Order, this is a preliminary principle. Uh, now, Mr. Mutter, would you... We, yeah, let me just, could, yeah, the, the, uh, the other part of that is uh, that in the early documents that were going back and forth between the uh, defendants and the session, um, especially on this issue, not only was the preliminary six referred to, uh, but since they were a mission church, the when and it was the whole thing came up about particularization, one of the steps in particularization is all, all of this is found in the uh, Book of Church Order, Chapter 5, uh, especially the steps in uh, the ninth section, so BCO 5.9, um, it just says you do this and this and this, and it's a very step by order. And one of the things it says is, and then the congregation has the right to elect as part of the particularization and organization, uh, a, a pastor, which is regularly or normally is the organizing pastor. However, if the, uh, if the man is not willing to continue in that role, or if the congregation does not desire to have him, then they, uh, the, search, the church has a right to be organized, and then they will set up a search committee and look for a pastor. So they don't have to uh, vote for the man. The man himself doesn't have to continue as the pastor of the church if he chooses, and the congregation doesn't have to keep him as the full-time uh, the full pastor uh, in particularization if they don't wish it. And the remedy is that then we'll do our uh, due diligence and search for a man who would fit. So we pointed that out, and that so to uh, uh, to allege that there was error on the part of these men for saying that they couldn't vote for him was very consistent not only with preliminary principle six, but it's also consistent with the very more application of it in uh, BCO five nine. Yeah, I, I I'm just I'm just trying to wrap my head around how something like this happens. Um, so, uh, Paul, you said earlier, did well? Did did you feel like the session attacked your character with these charges? I, 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 I mean, yeah. It, maybe if I could, Paul, just for a minute. Yes. Uh, the remember he said uh, Paul in his narrative. Uh, said the first thing that happened after this, the 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 optimum date or the fixed date is August 30th of that year. Uh, that's when they had the session met with these seven men and other witnesses and other people. And um, 
and it was that's where the session just felt like these guys were serious about this and though the session then responded with a report uh about a week or so later and basically demanding that they look the press day approved them the the assessment center approved them uh, the Memonet Committee of Press Day approved him, and therefore you have to approve him. Uh, and they sort of fixated on that they, uh, that was the only option. And if, uh, and if you cannot present any sin issues, then you don't have a right to do this. And so there was a written response to that, which is in the, uh, that, in the record, uh, which said, uh, that's not the only thing. We, we made a a uh, careful judgment has nothing to do. We didn't challenge his integrity. We didn't challenge his fitness for ministry uh, or his giftedness for ministry. What we're saying is we don't believe he's uh, gifted and set for the work that we perceive is necessary here in Jonesboro. And uh, and they gave some illustrations, uh, application of that. So the issue was more fit than it yeah. was uh, fittedness for ministry. Uh, the elders, it was at that point that they came back even more aggressive saying uh be, you know the membership vows five and six are uh, your uh we would demand that you reaffirm your commitment to those things sign a document to that effect have it on the one of the pastor's desks uh by a certain date and time uh to that effect and if not we don't know what we're going to do well when that happened we said well let's just they, they're really ratcheting it up. So that's when a complaint was filed. So there was a complaint dealt with all of these issues already of authority, how much the session could address. And they immediately and would sur summarily just dismissed, uh, denied that complaint. So it was carried to Presbytery. Presbytery on the complaint, which was alleging the session erred in a, a, ex, ex, um, exercising power or assuming power they, it was not given to them in the BCO, uh, and it was outlined with all the technical details. Uh, the uh, unanimous decision of the of the uh, commission that held that dealt with the complaint r ruled that the session erred and basically used the term. Do you have that phrase that you have it open there, Paul, where it says no reasonable person reading the statement of the session, uh, given how it was framed? Oh yeah, would, uh, you're talking would, from the from the complaint. Yeah, with the complaint when the answer that the complaint uh, that the uh, commission handled the complaint basically just said yeah no, I, I, I yeah. lost the page in this okay it's uh, all right well basically said so no here. reasonable person reading these words could think other than that the session was intent on say, uh, demanding that they uh, obey so and that and that if that's the case that was out of order because the session is was now violating the conscience of these individuals and demanding something that the Book of Church order itself does not demand. And uh, so the and that complaint was sustained by uh, Presbytery. Okay, so now we thought, okay, the matter is over. Within just a month or so after Presbytery, even before Presbytery finally approved it, the, the session then voted to move into judicial process and actually charged the men with the very things that we thought they would, that the complaint answered, and they found, so if you want to sort of have a double whammy, here we we made our case, we used the courts well, we argued it, we wrote the, you know, briefs, met with the com the um, the, com uh, the uh, commission for handling the complaint, and all of that, and even having submitted to all of that, the, they come back and they, with even before the press day formally voted to approve the action of the uh, of the uh, commission, which was required them, and we've since taken that out of the uh, BCO 15.3, uh, they, they filed charges against the seven that is, now brings a circle, full circle to uh, charge one, violating the ninth, the fifth commandment, and uh, charge two, violating ninth commandment, and no specifications. And I want to I want to add. I'm glad you mentioned that this was not just about the specifications. The SJC's decision was so thorough. Okay, they didn't leave a shred of of doubt, in my opinion. If if you read it and respect the high court's decision and reasoning, um, yeah, because it wasn't just a technicality because the indictments right. weren't. They could have rested there. They could they... have done that, but they didn't. They dove into the evidence. They dove into the record of the case. I don't know how they did it. Honestly, I mean, I lived it. All right. I lived it. And so, you know, when you 
I don't know if you can see how thick this this is <laughs> front and back, by the way. So I, I lived it, and I feel like they have a better understanding of the case than I do. I, I, re, I genuinely do. Um, <laughs> and and they, they were so meticulous, and so they dove into the evidence, and they looked at the record, and they saw that not only are the indictments out of order, the evidence that they did bring wasn't sufficient. It, it didn't meet the qualifications of evidence. And that's why there are these headings when it says there is no violation of the fifth commandment. There is no violation of the ninth commandment. And, you know, it's just chock full of information in the, in the SJC decision. So this, yeah. uh, this was certainly a pastoral moment in my, in, for me, I mean, I, I can speak for myself and, and Dom, you know, we, we kept hearing, look, the rules are the rules not and this is the travis you ask how this could happen and again i'm not a ruling elder i'm obviously not a teaching elder i'm just a lay person but it's obvious to me that there are people who just simply don't know the book of church order or the worst case scenario is they're deliberately ignoring it or twisting it or see the bco as some sort of obstacle to get what they want again that would be the worst case scenario so well let me let me ask you this you know, when uh word came down from the session and then from the presbytery, that you would be forbidden to partake in Christ's body and blood at the table. Now, that's a very serious uh, declaration. Um, we're basically unbelievers. We were treated as if we were unbelievers. Yeah. How, how did you? I mean, how did you process that? Eighteen was this eighteen months where the the bread and the wine would go by, but not for you. It wasn't full eighteen months. Thankfully, when our and this was not without controversy, but um, once we came under the care of Covenant Cleveland, um, uh, there was a you know, there was a time, uh, you know, after a little time went by, and we met with the elders, um, and the fact that under a, and now the fact that they were now our new session, and the other session had resigned, uh, they allowed us to partake of uh, uh, of the blood and the body. Um, while our case was under appeal yeah, in well, other words they sure. they lifted the sanction the administrative that, that the other right the administrative sanction that the other the old session <clears throat> had and uh said that when it, we're now the session you file an appeal has the effect of suspending the judgment and censure we're going to honor that during the course of the the appeal yeah and we're really and, i'm really thankful for that we're all really thankful for that they, yeah. they in, in many ways stuck their uh, stuck their necks out for us and uh and then this SJC decision i mean it it i mean it's vindicated vindicates them vindicates us yeah i mean the 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 session was not vested with any of the authority the above statements took for granted under that of the session of the prosecutor which we quoted a moment ago thus when the accused opposed the session's opinions and overtures regarding these matters they were not trespassing the fifth commandment i mean that's uh that's not just dealing in technicalities. Uh, so, it, you know, as terrible as what you suffered was, it produced some excellent resources to clarify the role of a temporary session. Uh, in a concurring opinion, uh, ruling elder uh, Jim Eggert stated, session had no lawful authority to continue to voice its support of the minister or assert its belief without hesitation that he should be offered the, to the congregation as a candidate to serve as its pastor at least not in the sense that to oppose the same would be deemed inherently divisive or censurable against the authority of uh, the session. And so I mean, <laughs> essentially, look, I mean, this is this is really, I mean, it's like, are we going to be Presbyterian or are yeah. we going to be Anglican? I mean, that's my question. Yes. Go ahead, continue reading. I'm sorry to interrupt, Ryan. No, that's, that's fine. I think that's an important point that sometimes we, we forget how Presbyterianism works. Session had no lawful authority uh, to insist the accused stop resisting the session's attempts to recommend the minister to the congregation. Well, members of a session in an established congregation at least have a right as individuals to express their position about a proposed minister. The members of a provisional session for a mission church, not being members of the mission congregation, do not even have the right to vote on the question of the call of the minister. I, I recognize, and we need to recognize, this is a, a concurring decision, so this is not uh, the court, but it is, I think, a helpful insight that clarifies and cautions regarding the role of a temporary session in a situation such as this. Um, so in light of all of these uh, statements and, and clarifications and corrections, 
by the uh, Standing Judicial Commission. Was there any apology? Was there an attempt to reconcile with the prosecutor or with your the session that falsely charged you? Uh, to date, there has been no one involved who has apologized to all seven individuals. Um, you know, two two of the witnesses uh, who are teaching elders have reached out to uh, you know one of our group and apologized and, and essentially expressed they wish they never had participated in this. This after reading the SJC ruling and opinion. So in that in that regard, you know, we, that's an answer to prayer uh, yeah. for a lot of us. But no, we we haven't received any sort of apology. And of course, we would only want an apology if it was sincere. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, the, one of the things that I have realized about this, um, cause I try to, I've tried to put myself in, in the other, uh, the, the, the teaching elder shoes, if you will. Um, and, and as much as we were standing up for our rights as congregate members, uh, that's laid out in the BCO, um, the BCO is even more so for the protection of the character of teaching elders. So, I mean, when you, when you don't go by the BCO and you falsely convict somebody and you falsely, you know, you remove the table from them, um, at the end of the day, now that, now that we're vindicated, um, there's now obvious questions of character called into play here. And if you go by the book, you avoid those questions, right? If you, <laughs> at least that's my opinion. So I don't see the BCO as an obstacle. I see it as something that protects the reputations of teaching elders specifically in the judicial process. Well, let me, you know, one of the things that this does highlight uh, for me is the importance of church officers knowing the book of church order. Uh, the issue here seems as though uh, the session and then the presbytery simply didn't know or didn't follow the book of church order. And that had, I don't think as an overstatement to say, that had horrific results in the interim, at least. Let me, if I may just put there, the, the, the first day at one time did because the complaint was first, and it was actually a little bit more technical hmm. and dealt with uh, principles that were part of it, that yeah. were argued. And if they, if the press day had, when the judicial case came through, had based, gone back to that, com the complaint, uh, to, to reflect on what they would do judicially, we wouldn't be having this conversation, probably. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Cause I, I, you know, wasn't privy to the complaint. I, all I've seen is the is the verdict yeah. in the in the handbook. But it was an so when, It was a, the the opinion of the press day in that complaint would have resolved if the if the session of the church had read it carefully, they would never have filed the the uh, sure charges. Yeah, but so, they didn't read it. Yeah. And when and so when when the complaint goes back up to presbytery, they use the wrong standard of review. Oh, you mean the uh, the appeal, not the complaint? Yeah, I'm sorry, the the appeal. Yes, thank you. The, when the appeal goes back to the presbytery, the, they use the wrong yeah. standard of review. So it seems like all throughout the process, when when, when a process was actually inter instituted, so from indictment to uh, SJC, they just didn't follow the Book of Church Order. And so, Dominic, I want you to address this, but the the the, the appeal was, I mean, the, the appeal, because we had so many lines of communication, this letter, that letter, I mean, I don't know, I mean, they referenced it in the, in the case, in the, in the summary of the facts that we were saying, please, hey, these indictments are unenforceable because, because they're, they're written poorly. And, and it just, you know, we went, we went back and forth. And so, so the appeal was very specific. It was detailed. It clearly showed mm -hmm. that they did not follow the BCO. And so the apparent response to that was to just flip through the BCO and find some some wild-eyed crazy legal theory uh to 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 adjudicate our appeal based on something <clears throat> that you're not supposed to adjudicate appeals on you know grossly right. unconstitutional versus w were any of these processes violated and uh and and that's you know that's what was needed or that that was the excuse that they needed to essentially maintain the guilty verdicts. And it was and it was done. Uh, you know, again, this benefit of the doubt was uh, was was given to the session. And the SJC said, no, no, that, right. that was wrong. So. And that was. Yeah, no, I exactly what we we've been saying. But now we say it even clearer, though, if you read the uh, decision of the Judicial Commission of Presbytery. So remember, you had to complain first. And that was rock rib solid. And if they had followed it, the judicial issue would never have been a case. 
um, the but but the judicial commission that was for the appeal was of a totally different uh, flavor, and they didn't interact with the uh, book of church order uh, or with the uh, record of the case that was developed for that. And they found things like, for instance, in 32.5, the phrase as much as possible was used with reference to as much as possible in the, the times, places, circumstances. Uh, and they took the as much as possible is that this gives the court wide discretion as to what they include in the indictment or leave out. So it was, a you know, the, um, it was amazing that they would have found that. So the uh, that was something that the uh, uh, you have it up on the screen. In summary, the failure of indictments to include the specificity so obviously available is unjustifiable under BCL 325. And we find that the broad indictments were abused to the prejudice of the accused who were not adequately informed of the charges against them. And that comes be in really response to the Presbytery's Judicial Commission which said uh, that, no, there was no violation. They had wide discretion to include or not exclude. And we, of course, when we argued the case then before the SJC, we brought that up again. <clears throat> and we showed those four times that I recounted earlier in, the, in our discussion here, uh, where the, the appellants um, four times different emails, each one dealing with the same topic. No, you still haven't gotten it. We still don't know. Uh, look at the book, look at the history and so forth. And although those were so much in the case and those were just completely dismissed by the Presbytery's Judicial Commission. Yeah. And, and, and so we were we were we were asking for the specifics of the indictment and what we were getting back was and this happened in our in our hearing. So, you know, we had a hearing over the appeal at Presbytery. And we started our arguments. And when we started talking about the specifics and how there were no specifics in the indictment, we had members of that commission, that judicial commission, that immediately cut us off and immediately were, were talking about how, oh, well, it says if possible. It says we have to put specifics if it's possible to put specifics. And the SJC shreds that argument and says specifically in an indictment, a, spe a specificity in an indictment is the rule, not the exception, and is mandatory, not optional. Okay, so BCO 32.5 states that the times, places, and circumstances, quote, should, emphasis added, be set out in the indictment if possible. So the auxiliary verb here, should, in BCO 32.5, imposes an obligation on the court and prosecutor to include the prescribed information uh, in the indictment to the extent it is reasonably available to the court. And so we were, we were essentially being told, hey, we can't give you any more specifics about what you did, it's just not possible. And we don't have to do it. And and the SJC says, and unfortunately, teaching and ruling elders on the Judicial Commission, apparently they bought into the argument. Well, it says if possible. The, the Presbytery's Judicial Commission. Yes, correct. The what did I say? Yeah, did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. No, no, you didn't. But just because we, there are two different judicial commissions, there's right. this General Assembly yeah, and then the Presbytery's Presbytery. The judicial Commission bought, bought into that argument that, well, we don't have to tell them what they did. <laughs> Wow. Um, so it seems like there there was a, a reluctance um, or, or just an ignorance uh, of, of the Book of Church Order. Now, um, George Sayer's podcast, the Presbyterian Reformed Churchman, recently interviewed uh, two SJC judges, John Byes and Howie Donahue. And one of the things that uh, Ruling Elder uh, Byes emphasizes right near the end, you got to listen to the very end of the podcast, and the audio is kind of rough, but I, 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 want, I, I want to play it here nonetheless. I had two items that uh, I think would be helpful um, at the lower court level. Um, one, I would urge, uh, Stephen, uh, when you have a judicial case that comes up, don't hesitate to reach out to somebody that's got more experience. Um, SJC members, um, you know, generally you can't get involved in those items, but there are former members of the SJC who are happy to help other people in your presbytery, perhaps. Um, and uh, I think one of the best things that our presbytery did in a case we had a couple of years ago um and i think it's worthy of consideration uh, at the session level too we had uh, some complainants 
uh, come to the presbytery with a complaint against the session of the local church. Um, we knew that the complainants were not experienced. And so the presbytery appointed a member of the presbytery to serve as an advisor to this group just to help them understand the rules, to help them to present their case. Um, he was not really an advocate for them as much as he was a guide. But as it turned out, he was also able to counsel with them and to help them to, you know, see some of the nuance of the case. Uh, ultimately, the case was not tried by the presbytery, but it was resolved within the local church. And I'm convinced that a, a big part of that was because there was someone experienced who was helping them through the process. They didn't feel that they were disadvantaged by being um, uninformed and, and inexperienced. Um, and they understood that the presbytery wanted to hear from him, from them. They wanted to, to, to get a fair hearing. And I think, you know, in, in many instances, even if people don't get the judgment they want, if they know they've been heard, that goes a long way toward peace and purity in the church. But that's really good. I mean, if our, our ultimate, we want we want reconciliation, we want justice, and so even uh, even those who we may, may disagree with, we want to make sure that they have they feel like they're being treated fairly, and they have the information to be able to navigate our complicated system. Most again, if you're talking about members of the church in particular, they don't they don't know how our polity works like you know like they may have 50 years ago or so. So so they're. You know, two judges on our judicial commission, and I think you heard their heart. If you weren't watching, you couldn't see that uh, Elder Donahoe was, you know, nodding his head. But a couple of things that uh, uh, former moderator Bice, uh noted was that um, people need to know the book, and if you don't, you know, if you've got a situation on a session where you're going into judicial process, reach out and ask for some help. It seems like had the had the session reached out for some help, this this may not have happened. They may have realized what uh, Elder Eggart says in his uh, in his concurring opinion, and then he says something else that I thought was very interesting was a situation in his presbytery where they they had some uh, a neophyte trying to bring a complaint to presbytery, and the presbytery said, you know, we're going to appoint a member to come alongside you. And did you, did you, I don't know if you could hear because the audio was a little bit rough, but he said the result of that was that the complaint wasn't even adjudicated. It was withdrawn because they reconciled. They came together because everybody felt heard. And I, I just think that's great advice, uh, not necessarily for, for this case particularly, but just as a rule for when judicial process is not the first resort. It should be the last resort. Um, it seems like in, in this whole process, the session just didn't reach out, the presbytery didn't reach out for help to understand uh, what was going on, because time and again, the SJC points out these errors of form, of understanding, of presumption, even in the way the presbytery reviewed the case. Uh, there just didn't seem to be an interest in getting help to come alongside to, what does it say? This, there was such obvious specificity available, but they didn't include that. So as we kind of bring things in for a landing, what's the status of the of the church plant now? You said uh, they they tried to shut it down. Uh, they paid out a severance. Um, yeah, and you're not currently seeking to be particularized. I guess uh, is that is that right? That's that's correct. We're we're going to you know we're going to wait at least a year I think, and and we're just going to heal and and worship the Lord on the Lord's day. And we recently started meeting at night too, uh, going over, uh, kind of a distinctives class. It's been really good. You know, for many of us, it's been three years since we've done anything mm. extracurricular other than a Sunday worship. Um, wow. you know, and so that has been really good. Um, and I, you know, there, there, there are other, there are other victims here. It's not just the seven of us. I mean, there's other, and I mentioned our wives, but there's other members of the church that didn't know anything about this. And, uh, ended up leaving because of it, and they're still very confused. Certainly, given com up on Presbyterianism completely, uh, and they uh, they don't understand how there just doesn't seem to be accountability. Um, yeah, with what was what with what was done, and so 
you know, that there's still that that's, 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 you know, people are wrestling with that in, in some, in some unhealthy ways, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. But those of us who are here at Christ Redeemer Presbyterian Church, we are exciting. We've got, you know, we've had new members join. We've got other members who want to join who are finding us. We recently started meeting at a Nazarene church uh, here in Jonesboro um, that they've al allowed us to, you know, use their facility uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, we meet at 9 a.m., so it's a little earlier than traditional, but we're happy to do it because, uh, you know, we have a, a designated place and, you um, Things are going great. We're, we're really enjoying it. And we're looking forward. You know, all of this stuff has happened. OK, and we, you know, it, it's a sore spot. It's uh, something that we we have to just kind of get over. Um, but now we want to do the work, finish the work and plant the church. And uh, that is our goal. So. Uh, yeah. And I would say that the uh, <clears throat> throughout this, like I said, we visited at least weekly on zoom to make sure we're you know just kept up on brief as to where things were in the pipeline and so forth but the other thing that i uh extol i said right now i'm going to say some you know things biblical uh ex exhortation encouragement and so forth that probably sound a little pious right now and but hopefully it'll have um uh, you know context later and so that you don't fall into uh a pity party uh, recognize that in the church things like this happen and that's unfortunate but it it does uh, I teach church history and uh, point out those things that every generation of the church faces uh, issues that shouldn't happen but they do uh, and then i point to some of the great saints in the past uh, in the scriptures you think about uh, joseph living faithfully for god doing everything right uh, goes into potter's house uh and uh, his uh, part of his wife hits on uh, Joseph. Uh, he quickly runs, but she still has his outer coat. So she now came up with a talk about abuse, uh, a sec accused him of sexual abuse. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it was wrong. There were no other witnesses, but the, he Potiphar. spent 13 years in jail because, uh, but Potiphar didn't believe his wife, but he, because uh, he didn't kill Joseph. But I said, so here's Joseph surf, suffering for righteousness sake. We don't like to think that way. We'd like to say, I'd love to rejoice and for righteousness sake, you know, but uh, it does happen. Um, you know, Paul, David was chased there all over the countryside by Saul. Saul thought he was going to take over as king because he knew he had been, uh, David had been anointed. And so when uh, Saul goes to relieve himself in a cave, David happens to be in the back of it. He cuts on the edge of the robe, waits for him to go out. And he gets on the other side and he holds up the thing. He says, look, is this proof enough for you that I don't intend any harm? I'm going to wait for the Lord to work because uh, this is his kingdom. And uh, so Saul falls into uh, immediate uh, piety and says, uh, oh, David, you're more righteous than me. Oh, yes, you're right. And I'll be careful. Ten minutes later, puts a contract out on him again. So he has to be chased around. Now, of course, we looked at the Lord Jesus himself suffered um, with as a lamb without uh, uh, opening his mouth. He suffered great uh, stripes uh, being beat up. And then Paul, even in his own ministry uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 11, 12, especially in 12, when he gets to the final point there, um, where he has that thorn in the flesh. And he says, I prayed to God. He says, look, I'm an apostle and I'm a great evangelist and I'm writing the scriptures and I'm being a disciple, a church planner, and all these things, you know, you, you know, let me loose, and I can only operate at fifty percent with this thorn in the flesh. But the, uh, uh, you know, what what would happen if I could do a hundred percent? And God comes back and says to him, "My, uh, you know, my uh, will is perfected, my strength is perfected in weakness." And then Paul says, "Ah, okay, that's the principle." And he says, "Then I would rather than be weak in order that God's strength might be magnified." And therefore, then he gives the the subtext there. It is necessary for those who are walking with Jesus to suffer, even for the faith. So, you know, you have all those and there are many others. The point is, yeah, it's not just put in there in the scripture just so that we can ooh and ah about Paul or David or Joseph. But it, it, it speaks to us. Uh, and there are things that happen that are just not fair. They're not right. Now, we want to correct it. It was what has happened here. Hope this uh, a program like this uh, and then just the, the um, result of the uh, judgment that the SJC gave will be a 
a, a wake up call to the church about the possibility that there can be over abuse of power uh, top down as opposed to servanthood and shepherding from the bottom up. And uh, so when that happens, uh, we as believers need to realize how important it is to learn from these things, even when it's something that happens in the church where we're saying it shouldn't happen. Well, it does. And that's unfortunate. And um, so I, I and I can't commend these um, seven men again for, uh, you know, really, you know, they, there were times when they said, this is not worth it. Let's just walk away. It was getting too long. And I just pled with them, you know, let's stick it out, uh, you know, suffer on the, for righteousness sake. And uh, of course, you know, it was easy for me to say because I wasn't, but <laughs> but uh, but I felt their pain. I really did. And uh, but I said, let's I think that we we do have a good case um, and that we not only dealing on the substance of the matter, but the procedure. So it was both hand. It wasn't yeah. just a process case. And uh, so the relief now that still means that. Paul and the others still rest with it, how they feel about these individuals that took thought. You asked about apologies. Well, in time, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that up to yeah, the Lord. It sounds like there's a desire to reconcile on the, the part of the Jonesboro Seven, or at least the one well, that represented here. If the opportunity comes, I'm sure they would take it. But at this yeah. point, they learn from that experience and go forward regardless of how, what God does in the lives of the others that were involved. And um, so that 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 was all the commendation. So behind the scenes, it wasn't just a matter of uh, dotting eyes, crossing the T's judicially, and what does the BCO yeah. say? It was it, there was a lot of angst and pain and and um, questioning. We spent, I mean, close to the time of getting ready for the uh, write the brief to send to the SJC for the uh, appeal. I mean, we spent hours on Zoom because we were looking at every word, every sentence to make sure what we were saying was accurate, that we were not just going to say something uh, that was exotic or extreme just for the sake of itself. We, we wanted it to be an honest assessment that uh, what happened was not right. Uh, mm. They didn't follow the book where people of the book, the big book, the scriptures, and also the Constitution the book, book, uh, book of church order, and and we're also uh, people who do the things decently and in order, and um, so as painful as it is, as much as we like to take out the long knives and go at it, um, let's wait on the Lord and let's use the means that He has given to us here. So uh, the Jonesboro Act of the, or is the J Bros, as I like to call them, the seven J Bros, is uh, is going to be a lesson for all. Uh, to um, say, go through it, go through it right. Be careful, watch your anger, and trust yourself to the Lord, and He will take you. He will take care of you. Amen. Those are those are good words. Yeah, I, I think there are many takeaways. Just to summarize, three. You know, one is the danger of not following the process. You know, Paul, you alluded to some folks have just walked away from the church, maybe the faith altogether, because they saw what was happening. Um, the the pain and suffering that was inflicted on your family because process was not followed uh, by the church courts. But uh, you know, another uh, and a much more important takeaway is that God preserves His church. I mean, you, you've told me that the church is growing. The church is meeting morning and evening now. You've got a new uh, facility. You're working with another uh, faith community in Jonesboro. God preserves His church. And new pastor. And a, new, and a new pastor, and so wait on the Lord. I think that's the third takeaway. You know, wait on the Lord. Uh, look at what Amen. He's done. Yeah. No. And 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 we, you know, we everybody had days where they, you know, wrestled more with what are we doing. You know, yeah. every time you get some sort of judgment or whatever, or some letter, they still, you know, they still don't listen to us. They, you know, they think that we've done what we what we did not do, what we believe we did not do. Um. And yet, you know, then there are the the, the 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 time that I'm, I'm telling you the the closeness that we do have um with each other you know going through this going essentially to war with one another uh, not with you know with each other i mean that's essentially what this what this was an ecclesiastical version of it and nobody nobody wants to take you know happen again there are casualties with that as we previously mentioned but the lord i think has used this case to expose um uh, just expose a lot, just expose what you said, the dangers of not going, you know, by the book. Um, it's also an encouragement 
uh, in terms of the fact that these men on the SJC, um, and I, I guess I, as I say this, it just makes me nervous. The fact that we're all mortal and eventually the makeup of the SJC is going to change, uh, uh, you know, different people, but like th those men, uh, specifically the ones who adjudicated our case, um, uh, to E Paul Bankson, uh, ruling elder Jim Eggert, uh, to E Carl Ellis, to E Guy Waters, uh, R E Dan Carroll, um, Dan Carroll, he was an, he was an alternate, but in the, in our hearing, Dan Carroll started the hearing off asking about the addendum. Where did this addendum come from? And I just thought, I just, I couldn't help. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't want to react, but in my heart, I just, I was like, thank you Lord for these men who, cause we, that was what we were always banking on. We were banking on this idea that at some point we're going to get to the highest court in the land and they're going to make words mean what they say. Okay. Mm. They're, they're going to enforce what the words say within these goalposts. As I was talking about earlier and, and it happened, it actually happened. And I, 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 uh, you know, and it was such a relief that we finally got, um, reasonable men who were not looking at this through, you know, they were looking at it dispassionately and that's tough to do. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give it, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, it is, it's hard to do that when, when every presbytery does have some sort of, you know, politics involved in it, right. Where you're being asked to rule against your friends. We're just a couple of, we're just a bunch of dirt kickers from Arkansas. And we've now used the process, you know, to stand up for our congregate rights and the temptation is to say, well, well, who are you? And I, and these are my buddies, you know, I, we go to GA and Presbytery three times a year. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the, uh, that, that, that's the, the, that's, that's tough, you know, but, I, but, you know, the, the good news is, is that, you know, in the end it was looked at dispassionately and, you know, we're, we're able to go on planning the church and, and go on, you know, in church life. So anyway. Yeah, it does speak to the integrity of the judges on our SJC, how they looked at this and the seriousness with which they they took this case. Um, well, I, you know, I, I'm just so sad and grieved, uh, shaken. You know, reading reading the verdict in the in the handbook was disturbing, and I'm so thankful you survived uh, this process, the abuse of this process, and continue to serve in the in the PCA. Um, it sounds like you're excited about what the Lord continues to do in Jonesboro. Uh, any any closing words for either of you? You can uh, you can donate to our church and our cause at ChristRedeemer.org. Just click the Give button if you uh, if you feel so inclined. We are we are dedicated to planting a uh, reformed confessional uh, ordinary means of grace church in the PCA in Jonesboro. In Jonesboro, That's right, and beyond. Yeah, I've already given my little spiel. I uh, appreciate you being able to promote all this, and uh, with the hope that it'll incite in us a desire to know that the book Church Order is not a sterile, boring document. It really has life, uh, if when it's used as intended. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you both for your time and uh, your faithful perseverance. Thank you, Ryan Beasy. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the work you do. Thanks for joining the conversation on the Westminster Standard, which is the podcast of Jude 3. For additional resources or to make a donation, visit our website, jude3pca.org. To read more about the Jonesboro 7, please visit my substack, which will be linked in the description. These men are remarkable, and it has been a privilege for me to get to know some of them. In the wake of this ordeal, and now on the other side, their goal is to reconcile and to promote the glory of Christ, even in reconciliation. You can support the work of Christ Redeemer Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas, by visiting the website christredeemer.org, and then select the Give tab. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a review in the podcast app of your choice if you feel so inclined. And I would be so grateful if you would share this podcast on your social media. Please come back again next week for more content Promoting confessional renewal and biblical fidelity in the Presbyterian Church in America. Thank you.